On that muted morning that we now call Easter, the disciples came and looked into an empty tomb. We are here today because of the faith that was instilled in them and us. And we come to hear the most glorious good news the world has ever known. Please stand as we are called to worship on this Easter morning. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at last he will stand upon the earth. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. I am he that lives and was dead, says the Lord, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Hallelujah. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord God most holy, as the chilly day has dawned, we are drawn to this place as were disciples of old, staggering from the weight of events that burden, too weak to make any difference. We come without fully understanding why Jesus would suffer so for us or how we could be so loved but we also cannot stay away from the empty tomb. Its mystery is irresistible. By your grace, great God, startle us and unleash your power among us to raise us from our weakness and into the dawn of resurrection's hope and joy. Give us now voices to sing out the praises that we can hardly comprehend, but can gladly give. Grant us passionate voices to declare to the world the hope that has been given us in the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. Please join in singing hymn number 123, Jesus Christ is Risen Today.
sin grabs hold of us all, burying us in grief, despair, and shame. Yet confession frees us from the burdens of sin as God raises us to new life and washes our transgressions away. Together we turn away from the darkness and face the light as we pray. Mighty God, by your power, Christ is raised from the dead to rule this world with love. We confess that we do not always believe in him or honor his lordship. We confess that we fall into doubt and fear. There is too little gladness in our hearts and gratitude is slight. We have fallen away from our Lord in his hour of need. Forgive our dread of dying and our hopelessness. Set us free for joy in the victory of Jesus Christ, who was dead but now lives and promises new life to all who believe now and forever. Amen. What then are we to say about these things? Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, intercedes for us all. And neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Brothers and sisters, believe the good news and know that we are all forgiven and be at peace. Alleluia. Amen. be seated. Grace and peace to you and welcome to worship, Easter worship here at First Presbyterian Church in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And we greet so many who worship with us by way of television broadcast throughout the center part of the state of Alabama. Easter greetings to you and thank you for being a part of our worship together. We welcome families that are here. Many of you have gathered from a great distance and we're grateful that you can be together. And others of us who don't have family nearby are thankful that we can be a part of the one family of faith. In particular, we're thankful for our many university and college students who are here. I know you miss your churches at home and your Easter celebrations there, but we're thankful that you were at the early service at 6 a.m., some of you, at the 9 o'clock service and here today. We are thankful for your faith. I understand it's dead week coming up. Is that right? Okay. Uh, pray for not only for our students, but for mercy for our professors. We'd like for all of you to let us know that you're here. If you would, sign the attendance pads and pass those back that we may have a chance to greet you more personally. And if you're looking for a church home, please know we're looking for you. We'd love for this to be your home of faith. I'll be offering an inquirer's class beginning next Sunday, right during the Sunday school hour at 945, just before the 11 o'clock service. Uh, for those who want to know more about our whole corporate journey of faith, about baptism, the Lord's Supper, and about the uniqueness of Presbyterians. I'm the only one who's made all four of them in a row, so if you can't make them at least the, the next one or the one after that, try to come. We'd love to tell you more about these opportunities. We also uh, want to announce about the one great hour of sharing. You'll find in your uh, pews there are some little envelopes. The one great hour of sharing is uh, an offering taken up by our denomination all across the country. 
The monies are held until there's a disaster, at which time the church is ready to reach out in the name of Jesus Christ. April 27th, those monies came to Tuscaloosa, Alabama to help rebuild this city. So remember this offering and be thankful and generous. One announcement that's not in your bulletin is that for those of you who have always wanted to sing the Hallelujah Chorus with a marvelous choir, you are invited to do so. During the last hymn, you may go up and the uh, tenors and the altos are on this side. They have scores of music for you and the sopranos and the baritones and basses on this side. Go up and sing with the choir and give your praises to Almighty God in that special way. At this time, we also have uh, a special speaker, Dr. Roger Sayers, will come forward. Minute for mission, he is on the transition committee. As some of you know, I am retiring soon. It, I am retiring when? December 2014. I'm not gone yet. But there are some plans already in store for us. And Roger, if you'll tell us about those. Other members of the committee are Kimberly Gibson, Susan Haynes, Wayne Musselwhite, Margaret Strand. So the transition uh, committee, its uh, overall responsibility is to keep you informed about the steps in the transition from Charlie Durham to his successor. More particularly, we see our responsibilities as threefold. First, preparation and posting of a timeline that reflects progress through the various steps in this transition, including uh, recruitment of an interim pastor, the nomination and election of members of a pastoral search committee, and the search process itself, which of course will culminate in the appointment of, uh, of a pastor. Also, the committee will ensure that appropriate festivities uh, will be planned to honor the service of Charlie Durham. The timeline that I mentioned will be posted at the entrances to the sanctuary, the chapel, and Warner Hall. Second responsibility is the preparation and distribution of answers to questions that are most often asked about the foregoing process. And that will be facilitated by the availability of a question comment box at each of the same locations as the timeline. And finally, uh, scheduling of one or more open meetings to answer questions from the congregation and to receive and relay uh, to staff and session any concerns or anxieties, I hope there, there won't be any of those, uh, about this transition. We'll hold at least two sessions, one probably after the 11 o'clock service, one uh, probably Wednesday night uh, after dinner, and perhaps a third one at some time if needed. So we want your participation. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Dr. Sayers. Also, many of you have brought a pink envelope that has your pledge for our capital campaign, Behold, I am doing a new thing. We'd love to receive that in the offering plate. This time, Amanda and Les Fowler present their daughter for the sacrament of baptism. Elder Bob Singleton will be assisting in the service. Friends, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting in his righteousness and to his children's children. The sacrament of baptism is a gift. It's a gift that marks us forever as God's own children. Yes. Well, okay. It is a gift that reminds us that we are claimed by God in Christ Jesus long before we can ever claim Him. It's a sign of our cleansing of the sin in which we are born. It's a sign of our dying and rising with Christ. It's a sign of our engrafting into the household of faith. The Lord Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. And he took the little children up in his arms and he blessed them. St. Paul has added that the children of believers are to be numbered among the holy people of God. Amanda, unless your daughter is not at the point where she can express her faith, so I'll ask the faith in which she shall be raised. 
In presenting your daughter for baptism, do you confess your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and do you promise a dependence upon the grace of God to bring her up in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord? Do you? And do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and to nurture her by word and deed, teaching her and showing her what it means to be a follower of Christ? Do you? We do. Let us pray. We give thanks, O God, for you are the voice above the waters, thundering wisdom and showering grace. For in the beginning your spirit moved over the watery chaos, calling forth order and life. Through the waters of the Red Sea, you delivered your, ch your people out of slavery into the Promised Land. In the waters of the Jordan River, Jesus was baptized and anointed with your Spirit. By the baptism of his own death and resurrection, Christ set us free from death, opening the way to new life. Now send your Spirit, Lord, to make this water a river of new life, a flood of your grace. Wash away the sin of all who are cleansed by it. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon them, that they may grow to follow Christ, who is the way and the truth and the life. To you, one God, all praise and honor. Amen. What is the Christian name of this child? Feeny Marie Fowler. Feeny Marie Fowler, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you now and always. Amen. Feeny Marie, child of the covenant, you have two names from two mothers. How wonderful and gracious that you bear the names of your family. You bear it beautifully and fully. This is the sacrament of baptism. Some call it christening because it's the Christian naming. You are given the name that is above all other names, and that's the name of Jesus Christ. You are claimed as his disciple. On Easter Sunday, it was the tradition that those who were to be baptized would gather. And on Easter Sunday, they would face the west and the darkness and confess and, and renounce the powers of evil. Then they would turn to the rising of the sun on Easter morning and would be baptized after professing faith. We welcome you, Feeny Marie, into the household of faith. These are the faces of those in this congregation and in this community that will support and encourage you in your life and faith. One day you will stand before the faithful and you will confess your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Until then, you will always know that you are God's precious child, that you are a gift beyond gifts, and we are thankful that your parents and your family are sharing you with this family of faith. Child of the Covenant, welcome to the church. Elder Bob Singleton will lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as the psalmist said, children are a gift from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Thank you, God, for this precious gift, and thank you for the gift of your risen Son. Grant that Feeny Marie grows in grace and love, shelter her from all of life's dangers and temptations, and bring her to confess Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. We pray for guidance for Amanda and Les. May their example wise counsel and love, lead her to live a life of strength, righteousness, faith, joy, and peace. Pour out your spirit on this church, dear God, that we may also provide the support required of us. Use this opportunity to remind us of our own baptism, Lord, so that we may celebrate as your children and serve you faithfully. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Feeny Marie wants her first Bible. <laughs> and here it is, sweet lady, for you to have and to hold as you grow in grace. Go in peace. Like for the younger children worshiping with us to come for a children's time together.
Good morning. How are y'all today? Today's kind of a big day, isn't it? What's today? It is Easter. That is absolutely right. And so y'all had a great morning, I'm guessing, and you've got some family around, and it's all, it's a lot of fun, isn't it? You got a lot of Easter eggs? I just that, got five. You got, fi- you got five Easter eggs. That's good. That's good. I, I, bet, I bet some of y'all got some Easter eggs. I still have the big Easter uh, You still got the big Easter egg? Well, that's good. Hey, listen, I want to I wanna tell y'all, you may think this is a little, a little random, a little strange, but I want to tell you, I thought today would be a really, really good day to, to talk to you about something that's very important to me, and it's, it's my pet unicorn. <laughs> pet unicorn, that's true. And, and his name um, is uh, his name is uh, his name is Sam. His name is Sam because what else would I name a, a pet unicorn, right? It's a great name, Sam, right? And we fly around. Do y'all believe me at all? Do you believe me? No. Why don't you? Unicorns aren't real. Unicorns aren't real. What would help? What would help you to to believe me? What like how, what would make you believe me? Um, your pet. To what see him? To see them. Oh, that's interesting. I guess I have to show. Well, actually, you're right. You called my bluff. I don't have a pet unicorn. Not at all. But y'all think that's kind of a crazy story for me to make up, isn't it? Kind of really crazy. Y'all are kind of like, I don't know about that, James. That's, that's a little, little weird. Well, let me, I want to tell y'all something about the very first, the very first Easter Sunday morning. Okay, so a few women, they went to the, they went to the tomb, right? Yeah. And well, they were expecting to see Jesus there, weren't they? Yeah, because Jesus died on C- the cross. Because Jesus died on the cross, exactly. And, and so they buried him in the tomb, and they were expecting to see him there. Hey, yes, sir. They nailed his hands in. This kid knows his Bible. They nailed his hands <laughs> in the cross. Mm-hmm. Preach it, brother. That's right. <laughs> exactly. The right. And then they killed the armies. That's right. So, so, then, so they were expecting to see Jesus, and then he wasn't there, was he? Was, he was not there. The women couldn't. They couldn't believe it, could they? They didn't know what to do, so they went and told people about it. Now, do you think they be, the people believed them? He came back to life. They didn't believe him at first. They thought I was kind of crazy, didn't they? And so they probably said, well, I've got to see this, don't I? He came back alive. And he came alive. That's right. He came back alive, but they didn't didn't believe him. So in order to believe him, what did they have to do? They had to see it for themselves, didn't they? God made him back alive. Because God brought him back alive. That's right. So so Peter, one of the disciples, he didn't... he was like, y'all, I got, I got to believe, I got to see this for myself. Peter was in a movie about Moses. Peter was in a movie about Moses. And Moses made God's blood. That's right, that's right. So, so his brother can move, the, so his brother can move. Man, out of the mouths of children. You never, it's, it, you're so right. So they, didn't, so they didn't believe him, so Peter ran to the tomb. He ran to the tomb with everything he got. You think he was out of breath? He was out of breath. He was panting. He didn't know what what was going on. And he went in. And what did he find in the tomb? Nothing. Nothing at all. And he began to believe. Now, in a couple thousand years, do you think people are going to be telling the story about my pet unicorn? Probably not. That's silly, right? But in 2,000 years from now, are they still going to be telling the story about Jesus in the empty tomb? Because it's true, and because it's the greatest, greatest story and truest story ever told. And to that, can y'all say hallelujah? Hallelujah. All right, let's pray together. Dear God, we give you thanks for these kids and for their imaginations and for the imaginations that we have inside each and every one of us. But we also give you thanks for the greatest story ever told. A story of an empty tomb, a story of running and being out of breath, and even a story that initially some folks didn't believe, but indeed it is true. And we give you thanks for Moses, and we give you thanks for, for all that you do, 
and we love you, God, and for this great Easter morning, in Christ's name we pray, amen. High five. That's right. And now, as y'all have heard, the greatest story ever told as it really was. I invite you to stand and to greet one another in the name of the risen Christ. As we hear again the biblical telling of the greatest story ever told, let us begin with prayer. Almighty God, by the power of your Spirit, roll away the stone and reveal to us the word of life. Amen. The scripture reading is from John's version of the resurrection story found on page 114 of your pew Bible beginning with chapter 20, verse 1. We become witnesses of the early morning discovery as Mary Magdalene approaches Jesus' tomb. Listen for the word of God. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. 
But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the risen Lord. And she told them that he, what he had said to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Easter begins with odd news, very odd news, that there's really nothing to hold on to. It's, it's not like Christmas, where the presence of God is, is seen in parents' arms, an utter specificity, squirming and burping in the midst of barnyard animals. Anyone who has ever changed a diaper has immediate access to Christmas. We can identify with the experience of Mary, the experience of Joseph. Besides, we get presents and we can put those in a closet and save it for the pink elephant Christmas later present. But not so at Easter. On this day, we are brought close up with the looming mystery about the resurrection where what's at the heart of the day has to do more with absence than with presence, more to do with what's missing than what's found, more to do with what's empty than what's visible. There's nothing to hold on to in Easter, and that's what makes Easter so difficult. It's in our text today, which was written long before we started doing lilies everywhere and um, uh, brass in our worship and all the excitement and the dressing up for Easter, long before all of this. In John's Gospel, there are almost no props at all. There's an empty tomb and there is Mary Magdalene. She's there to grieve, to pour out her heart, to sob, and there's nothing to hold on to. That's why it's so hard to get a grip on Easter because there's so little to grip. But even, not even a body, as, as Mary soon discovers. For friend or fro, someone has taken this body, because dead bodies don't get up and walk away, do they? There's nothing to hold on to except some, some folded up linens and some memories. Some memories of all the things that Jesus had said and done in their presence. Oh, and there are also those disciples still cowering in, in a room, afraid for their own lives. But what does that amount to, really? It'd be nice if there was something to hold on to. We know that from our cemetery experiences. We go there, and we take flowers, we go to remember. A pastor friend of mine in Long Island told about a young man who had just graduated from college, came home to celebrate, threw himself a party, and during that party he dove into a swimming pool and broke his neck. Days turned into months and finally pneumonia set in. The night before his funeral, as people gathered around the family and had finally trickled out, the only one that was left was his mother, and she was kneeling at the casket. And as she knelt there, her tears were streaming down. She said, I'll just stay here. I'll just stay here forever. Someone could bring me a blanket, and I could just stay right here. I could look at him. I could talk to him. Would somebody bring me a blanket? Can you blame her for that? even if there was nothing really to hold on to. Bishop Will Willimon has said it for all preachers. He said, every Easter we must preach to a world that is always in danger of thinking that death has the last word. Every Easter sermon is preached to a people in grief. On Easter we preach throwing our voices against the tragic, raging against the final enemy one more time. And it is the world's fate to not know the truth about Easter unless some inept preacher tells the story. Like Mary, the very first preacher of the Easter message, who obeyed the risen Lord's command, go, tell. 
Mary went with the message when what she really wanted to do was stay right there. She wanted to to stay with Jesus. She wanted Jesus back the way he was, back to be sure to pick up where they had left off, to continue teaching and working miracles, to uh, uh, model God's ideas in that community that they were forming, but back especially to live with this ragtag bunch of people he called disciples and to be with her. It would be the same except they would listen better to him this time. They would listen better because they have experienced something of the incredible love that he has shown them. What Mary wants is for Easter to validate the past. That's something that is very familiar, something she can hold on to. And that's what we want, isn't it? Don't we want to hold on to... Uh, uh, the past of our lives and that it'll give us freight for the present. A vision, for example, of the family, um, the way it's established to be and should be. A physical body that doesn't have arthritis, aches, and pains. A church that's established and large and entitled and privileged as it always has been. And a preacher who just grows so old he dies in the pulpit one day. Whatever. Or a community that's not riddled with violence and with drugs. A world, a world that's small again, not touching each other's markets or each other's borders. We want Jesus back to validate our past and most importantly, to validate us so that we too will have something to hold on to. And truth be known, that's part at least about what Easter is about. But more profoundly than that, Easter is a validation not only of the past that Jesus lived, but also the promises that he made for our future. Jesus lived as a Jew, and yet he promised that in his kingdom that would be coming, his father's house would be so big it would have many rooms. He knew the letter of the law. But he promised there would come a time where every single one of those laws would be a footnote to the law of love. He knew that back in the upper room, the meal he had with his disciples, when he shared the cup, it, it tasted bitter. But even then, he was setting his face towards the promise of a heavenly banquet at which everybody would be in the seat of honor and the cup of gladness would never run empty. It is this Jesus whom Mary finally encounters at the cemetery. Not the gardener at all, but one who, in raising from the dead, has not only validated a past, but has affirmed the promises for the future. Easter would not be about going back to the way things were and having something to hold on to. It would be about going forward with nothing to hold on to except the amazing sense that God has done something in the rising of his son Jesus that forever changes the shape of the world and human life. Jesus makes it clear to her when he calls her by name. He says, Mary. And she responds by calling him that comfortable, familiar name she had always used. And he says, no, no, Mary, do not hold me. He's not on his way back to the past. He's on his way to God. And he's taking the whole world with him. Now, there are choices to make along the road. Choices that you and I have to make even to come to worship this day or not. My choices were more simple. Do I wear my old black shoes or my new black shoes? Now, I knew I'd be standing a while today, and my old black shoes are broken in. They're soft. They're comfortable. They don't hurt my feet. They don't hurt my back. And they have a squeak. My left shoe squeaks when I walk, and everybody knows I'm coming. <laughs> my new shoes are stiff. They're not broken in yet, but they sure look pretty. I have my new shoes on. 
Maybe that's where, what we're about as a church. We've gotten used to the old comfortable ways about us that are broken in and old and broken down. But the promises are for incredible newness. This is odd news, that there's really nothing to hold on to. But it's curiously good news. The gospel, the most glorious news for this day and every day. And what we can do, of course, is what Mary does. She runs to tell others who will be willing to listen, and even those who won't, that we have seen the Lord. We can show by the way we live our life the difference that he has made. We can be grateful. We can be grateful for what he has done so that we can live expectantly and open-handedly and confidently towards the future because Easter reminds us that Jesus is already there, ready to greet us by name. The only thing we cannot do, Barbara Brown Taylor has said, is hold on to him. He asked us not to do that because he knows that, all in all, we would rather keep him with us where we are rather than let him take us to where he is. Better we should let him hold on to us, perhaps. Better we should let him take us into the white, hot presence of God, who is not behind us, but is ahead of us every step of the way. This is the glorious news of Easter to you and to me. Thanks be to God. Please stand. We stand together this day having heard God's word proclaimed, affirming what it is we believe this glorious Easter day, using the Apostles' Creed. Brothers and sisters, what do we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, sits upon the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to share with you now the prayer concerns of the congregation. We pray for those who are in the hospital, Bonnabelle Williams and C.M. Newton at DCH, Carolyn Amoson at UAB Highlands, and Jack Lee at Northport DCH. Two persons are in rehab, Cindy Perkins, Joe's sister at Northport, and Hutton Barron, Jim's father, at a rehab in Raleigh, North Carolina. We are, our prayers are also with two families who have experienced death. Uh, the family of Martha Moore, she died on Friday. The graveside service will be tomorrow at 11 a.m. at Tuscaloosa Memorial Park. Also the family of Tom Henry, this is Richard Henry's grandfather. He died yesterday at Hospice of West Alabama. The visitation will be tomorrow at 1 a.m. and service following at 2 a.m. both at Magnolia Chapel North. Let us turn to God in prayer, and when you hear God of resurrection, I ask you to respond with, hear our prayer. Let us pray. For the church throughout the world, that all who profess to honor the risen Lord may be faithful in their witness 
and courageous in their testimony to the way of Jesus. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For the members and officers of this congregation, that by the power of the Holy Spirit they may seek to build the church upon Christ, the cornerstone, and humbly live in faithful service. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For the governments of the world and its leaders, that the nations may dwell in peace, and that good will prevail over war, and people of faith may freely worship as their hearts direct. God of resurrection, hear our prayer for rain and sun in proper measure, and for abundant food and water for all who dwell upon the earth. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For the sick and those in need, we pray especially for Bonnabel and CM, for Caroline and Jack and Cindy and Hutton, and for any who are oppressed by wounds of the soul, God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For our neighbors, that we may live together in amity, and that strangers among us may find us to be hospitable friends. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For our enemies, that their sins may be forgiven them, and that they may find your peace. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. Almighty God, your Son promised to grant whatever we ask in his name. Let your Holy Spirit grab hold of us and empower us to minister to the world as his faithful disciples, that our work may signify to what we pray and show forth your eternal glory through Jesus Christ, who taught us boldly to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God has given us life in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. In gratitude, let us offer our hearts and the fruit of our labor to God's service.
Let us pray. All hail the power of Jesus' name as we before you fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown you Lord of all. Lord of our lives, Lord of all creation, Lord of all that has been, is, and is yet to be. We cry out hallelujah, thanks be to God this Easter morning for what the women did not find that day. A body broken by the world, stung by death, beaten and bruised. No, what they found was altogether different. Deep mystery, unfathomable light, and more than anything else, hope. It is this hope that confounds us, stirs us, moves, moves us forward, and it is this hope for which we owe you our lives. We prepare to leave this place not the same people we were when we arrived. We go out proclaiming news that some won't believe, others will scoff at, others will question, and others will find breathtaking and true. Whatever the case, wherever we are along the spectrum of faith, may our thanksgiving never be taken for granted. May our lives remain full because of what was left empty, a simple tomb that changed the world. May it forever change us. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we sing our closing hymn, number 122. And I remind you that you are invited to sing the Hallelujah Chorus with our choir. So if you would like during the singing of the hymn to make your way back, you may do so.
Even the stone in front of the front doors of the sanctuary has been rolled away. And you may go out through those doors if you've never been out them before. We are grateful for those who are joining with us in the singing of the Hallelujah Chorus. When it was sung for the first time, the King of England stood acknowledging the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And as we go, receive now this benediction from the letter to the Hebrews. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory now and forever. Amen.